So, we know what the environment is, we know what the concepts are, we know what we need to do. We need to design a mechanism, so we need to choose action sets and, um, and an outcome function. This is in general a, a very open-ended problem. Because you need to design a game, you can design pretty much anything. You can choose a fight to the death, you can choose an auction, you can choose uh, running 100 meters, you can choose anything. So action sets are infinitely rich. So how do we approach this problem? How do we choose what the players should do, should be able to do? And this is the first and probably the most important trick in mechanism design. And it is called the revelation principle. And the idea is as follows. In whatever game you design, the players will, you know, will have to do something depending on their private types. So for any given type, they will pick one action from whatever game they will let them play. So what if we cut the unnecessary step? What if we say, you know, you don't really need to choose any action. What if you just report your type to me, to the mechanism, to the designer, and I will play whatever game I design on your behalf? And this is what it is. This is what the revelation principle says. It says that you never really want to design a huge complicated game, because whatever the game is, the in effect with the rational agents, the effect will be the same if you just ask everyone to report their types. And you, as the designer, promise to choose something, choose the same thing that the game would have chosen, given these reports, and the equilibrium play in that game. Uh, and this will be the implemented outcome. So let's write that down. Fix some. Can someone please wave a hand again? Thank you. So fix some social choice function. What we will call a direct revelation mechanism. Is I guess for this given social chase function F is mechanism gamma, um, as usual, ag, such that for every player, the set of actions is equal to their set of types. So once again, you basically need to choose to point towards your type on, on the port. You need to choose your type from a drop-down list. That's the way. So, the set of actions for each player is the set of their types. And the outcome function, given the set of reports theta, so once again, here it's important that these are reports, is exactly the same as the social choice function, as the outcome prescribed by the social choice function for this type profile. So here we interpret these status as the actual types. So this is the direct relation mechanism. And what the revelation principle says is for any social choice function you can think of, you only need to consider direct relation mechanisms. And these will exactly tell you whether uh, your social choice function is implementable by any other mechanism or not. So basically, if direct relation mechanism can do it, then fine, you got yourself a mechanism. If the direct relation mechanism cannot implement your social choice function, then no other mechanism will be able to do that.
So the revelation principle. It is a statement. You can call it a proposition, but it is informal. Yet again, for kind of same reason. So suppose there exists. There exists a mechanism AG, that implements our social choice function F. Say that F is truthfully implementable. And the step I missed was defining what truthfully implementable means. I'm going to say exactly that. Social choice function f is truthfully implementable. Why am I writing all the wrong letters? Is truthfully implementable if it is implemented by a direct relation mechanism. mechanism. So as I just said, yeah, the idea is any social choice function is either truthfully implementable, so it can be implemented by a direction relation mechanism, or it is not implementable at all. But there are no social choice functions that can be implemented by some mechanism but not by the um, by the direct relation mechanism. And as I said, this is an informal definition because we have not, we still do not have a formal definition of implementation because we do not know what equilibrium concept we are working with. So we will do that in a few minutes. And in the meanwhile, I saw a question in chat. Is it necessarily the optimal mechanism one which reveals the true types? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the optimal mechanism here, because our criterion for the optimality of a mechanism for the time being is whether it implements a given social choice function. So if it does, then it's good. If, it's, if it does not, then it's bad. But there are no further gra gradation. So direct relation mechanism either it does or does not implement it. But if it does, then it is as good, according to, to that metric, as any other social choice function f. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the revelation principle. It seems like a bit of a cheat, which it is. So in which respects does it seem cheap, like cheat? Well, firstly, it kind of assumes that our designer is trustworthy, that our mechanism can be trusted with such private information as players' types. Because here, the mechanism says you should basically report everything that's relevant about you, for our purposes, to this mechanism. But the players might not be willing to reveal any of that in principle. So there are some privacy concerns here. And uh, 
in, in the real world, these privacy concerns usually stem from the fact that, you know, this information that you reveal might be eventually used against you. For example, if I reveal that I have high valuation for ice cream, then the ice cream man will charge me more forever since. So, so I do not want to reveal that kind of information. Um, I had some continuation of that thought, but I forgot it. Right. While if you employ some other mechanism, not the direct revelation one, there might be a game in which you might not need to reveal all of your information, but you may only need to choose some course action, which is which says a little bit about your type, obviously, but it does not reveal your type perfectly. Anyway. So we abstract from all these privacy concerns. We further assume that our designer can perfectly commit to this mechanism. So it's a continuation of that story, of the same story to some extent. But we are assuming that you know what whatever I said I will do, I will actually do once I learn all of your private information, all of your deepest, darkest secrets. And I will not want to change the rules of the game halfway through. So I can actually commit to this mechanism. For a counterexample, uh, say, in a second price auction, one person bid a million, another person bid 10. Then the designer of the seller only gets 10 for the item. If the designer could not perfectly commit, the designer could say, you know what, maybe you should pay a little bit more than 10. You know, you value this item at a million. Share the surplus. So this is another strong assumption. We assume that the designer can commit. And finally, yes, the important, another important part is that we are assuming that our agents are, in a sense, perfectly rational. So they play any game we give them with the rationality of a well, perfect economic agent. In words, it means that we cannot confuse the players. We cannot give them rules of the game which have, uh, you know, a hundred pages of small font. And we hope that they would never just read through, they will behave in a simple way. So we cannot do that. Because our agents, our economic agents, will always read through the whole small font. They will always see through the game, and they will always be perfectly rational. So you cannot confuse them by designing a very complicated mechanism. So the question, in case some people did not hear, is does the commitment mean that the principal will not want to change uh, the mechanism, or will the principal not be able to change mechanism? And the answer here is the latter. So the principal is just physically unable to change the mechanism. Um, so I don't know if, if there is a word in Danish for commitment, but I know that in Russian there is none. So Russians cannot commit, I guess. There's just no such concept in the language. So yeah, commitment is you, you promise to do something and you follow through on it, just for sure. You have no escape, you have no excuse to renege on your promises. But in, just like in the example that I gave of the second price auction, it might as well be the case that the principal will want to deviate. The principal will, want to, will really want to charge these guys more, or, you know, do something else, change, change the rules in some way. But, but don't. All right, cool. So we have 10 minutes left in this part before the break. And I think this is just enough time to fill in the missing gap. So I told you that all of these things, all of these definitions are somewhat formal, but not perfectly formal because we are missing the equilibrium concept. So let us now finally figure out what the hell are we talking about when we are talking about implementation. So equilibrium concept. So I gave you some warning that this will happen. So I hope that you had time to think. What equilibrium concept do you know? Nash equilibrium, our beloved one in economics and the most 
a standard basic one. Okay, that's a good start. What else do we know? Pretty much all of the other equilibrium concepts, or most of other equilibrium concepts, are some refinements of Nash equilibrium. So the one named was perfect Bayesian equilibrium. I will just write the abbreviations from this point onwards. And uh, perfect Bayesian equilibrium is something that we use in dynamic games with incomplete information or asymmetric information. Other concepts we can need are Bayesian Nash equilibrium, which is for static games with incomplete information. For extensive form games with complete information, we do not need PBE, but we can get away with subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. And you know you can continue this list forever with sequential equilibrium, market perfect equilibrium. Uh, all of the call refinements like the intuitive criterion or divine divinity. So we have Nash equilibrium and refinements. And I told you that most equilibrium concepts are refinements of Nash, but not all of them. In particular, there is a thing that I'm pretty sure you'll learn in your introduction to game theory before you get to Nash equilibrium. And I want you to try to think what it is. Yes, so the guess on Zoom was iterative elimination of uh, strictly dominated strategies. And well, we call that rationalizability. But there is an, there is an even simpler equilibrium concept, which is pretty much never used. It never comes up in game theory, with one prominent exception. And that exception being the prisoner's dilemma. And we have a much stronger equilibrium there than Nash equilibrium. And that equilibrium is in dominant strategies. Dominant strategy equilibrium. And I do not blame you for forgetting it. It really does never come up in game theory in the real world, in the you know, natural environment. But our privilege is that we are not confined to a given game. We can design our environment. And in particular, we can try to design our game in such a way that it would be the dominant strategy for every player to play truthfully in our direct relation mechanism. So we will do exactly that. And I will close this part with just a few more definitions that we will use. Strategy, by the way, is a full contingent path plan of play. So a strategy is something that prescribes you to play a given action in a given scenario. So in dynamic games, it can be you play this at this stage, and so on. But in our case, we have an incomplete information game. And here, strategy prescribes an action to every type. So that, will be, that is what will be important. Strategy AI in a direct revelation mechanism is an object that maps types into reports. But it will be the whole mapping rather than the simple action. So this is the true type and this is the report. And I'm still here somewhat confused because I remember I changed before today the notation. Before that I had strategies S, and for some reason I thought it would be better to label them A for actions. And I'm still... I now forgot why I did that. Once again I'll assume there was a reason for that. But maybe I did not think it through. So a strategy is a mapping from type to report. Strategy is dominant if you prefer to play to choose this mapping. 
So if you prefer to play this report for this type, uh, regardless of what everyone else plays. So, okay, so given some mechanism in general, your strategy A from theta i to A i is dominant strategy if, once again, for all types here, so for all types theta i and big theta i, the following holds your utility from the outcome G implemented after um, the game outcome in which you play this action and everyone else plays some profile of actions. So A minus I is a vector of everyone else's actions. This is a relatively standard notation. Okay, so your utility from this outcome, G, and your true type theta I is greater than your utility from an outcome G that could have happened if you reported any other action, if you played any other action in the mechanism. So your utility from this outcome and your true type. You must want to prefer to report this, to, to play this action, to play this action for any other action A hat in AI. So this is a definition, and it is a definition of a dominant strategy. You're mi we're missing an I on the A hat. Uh, it does not really matter because we are saying that A hat must belong in AI, but I I will consent to that, so you can do that. So does that's definition of dominant strategies. Does anything strike you as maybe slightly weird about it? Bingo. So if, it, if this is supposed to be dominant strategy, why is this a weak inequality? And the answer is, well, just because. So in principle, you have two kinds of dominant strategies. You have strictly dominant strategy, in which this inequality is always strict. And you have a weakly dominant strategy where this inequality is uh, weak for all theta i and a minus i. Oh, I actually did not write. We also need for all a minus i in, um, I'll just call it a big minus i. So yes, in the weakly dominant strategy, you have this weak inequality for all of these objects, but it must be strict for at least some profile of others' actions. So there must be some point to playing this over some other strategy in the proper weak, weakly dominant strategy definition. In our definition, you may have two actions which are exactly the same, and they will both be dominant they can both be dominant, even though they do not dominate each other. While in the classical definitions, uh, neither of them would be dominant. So this is a choice, because this is what we will work with. We will work with exactly this definition. We will allow this tie to exist, tie for being dominant, um, because it will just prove more convenient for us. A strategy profile is a dominant strategy equilibrium if the equilibrium strategy is the dominant um, strategy for every player. So strategy profile a star 1, a star n is a dominant strategy equilibrium if 
So on the slides I have it uh, in terms of inequality that copies the definition of the domain strategies, but let's just say that A star I is a dominant strategy for every player I. And this is a definition of dominant strategy equilibrium. So this is our equilibrium concept. Now let us, let us use this concept for good. In particular, we will plug it whenever we were missing the equilibrium concept, namely in our definition of implementation. So let's say that a mechanism gamma implements some social choice function f in dominant strategies if and then continue with the definition of implementation that we already had if there exists an equilibrium of the game induced by the mechanism G, such that the outcomes uh, little g of the equilibrium strategy profile coincides exactly with F for all theta. It's too long to write. I'm too lazy. And you have the definition already, so I will not write it. I will have faith that you are able to fill in this particular gap. So this is the definition of implementation in dominant strategies. If we can, if we, if we can even call this a definition, let's discuss. Is this a good implementation concept? The one that, that I did not write. So is dominant strategy equilibrium good enough for our purposes? Well, it's definitely good, right? We kind of like dominant strategies a lot because they're very robust. If you have a dominant strategy to play, you really have no reason to play anything else. So that's really good. Deviations are really unappealing in general. And that's one obvious benefit. Another obvious benefit is we do not need to care about what players think about others' behavior. So if I have a dominant strategy, I do not need to calculate how everyone else plays. I do not even know, I do not even need to know the distribution of everyone else's types because this will affect the distribution of their actions, right? So I do not need to keep track of distribution of their beliefs, which means that implementation in dominant strategies will implement the desired outcome even if players have misspecified beliefs. So even if beliefs do not coincide with the common prior that we have here. That, that's the reason we don't care about beliefs in dominant strategies, but we will care about beliefs a little later on. Okay, however, this is not, you know, there are still some imperfections that we cannot iron out. In particular, even if you have a domain strategy equilibrium, it does not mean that there are necessarily no other equilibrium. In particular, second price option is one example. Right there, we have an equilibrium in weekly dominant strategies. It's weekly dominant to report truthfully your own type. But there are still other equilibria, which are maybe weird. For example, there is an equilibrium in which one person reports a valuation of a million for an item, and everyone else reports zero. So that one person gets the item and pays nothing for it. But then it's not optimal for, the, for everyone else to outbid this player, because their bid is ridiculously high. So this is an equilibrium, and it's weird. And it coexists with our domain strategy. So there is a subfield of mechanism design which deals with, I believe it's called exact implementation, meaning that we want our equilibrium, the, the one we're looking at, to be the unique equilibrium of the game induced by our mechanism. We will not be talking about this in great detail in our uh, course about exact implementation, but it's out there if you're interested. 
Another issue with domain strategy equilibrium, another thing that it does not account for, is it is not necessarily collusion proof. And the simplest example here is prisoner's dilemma. You have two players. It is a dominant strategy for each of them to do the bad thing. But if they somehow collude, coordinate, decide to cooperate, so if they maximize their joint payoff instead of individual payoffs, they will both do the good thing and not the bad thing, and they will obtain a much higher payoff. So not robust to collusion, it does not eliminate other equilibria. And one thing to keep in mind is it, we are never protected from designers' model mis misspecification. So domain strategy equilibrium uh, saves us if players have misspecified model of the world. So if their perception of the environment we are in differs from that of the designer. But if the designer has incorrect perception of reality, then you know there's nothing we can do. We are pretty much assuming throughout that the designer knows exactly what he's doing and the designer is right. Now that we have discussed the implementation concept, we can talk about the revelation principle. This part was particularly confusing in class, so I decided to re-record it. First of all, we skip the definition of truthful implementation now because it is not really specific to the equilibrium concept. In particular, a social choice function f will be truthfully implementable in dominant strategies if it is implemented in dominant strategies by a direct revelation mechanism. So you can see this is exactly the same definition as we had before, except now we specify that both instances of implementation happen in dominant strategies. In the rest of the course, we will be using a specific label for such social choice functions. We will call them dominant strategy incentive compatible rather than truthfully implementable in dominant strategies, which is just a convention in the field. Going back to the revelation principle, taking our notion of implementation and plugging it into the informal statement that we had before, we get the following theorem, which is admittedly written in a weird way on the board. It says that if there exists a mechanism gamma that implements social choice function f in dominant strategies, then f is also truthfully implementable in dominant strategies. Or equivalently, f is also dominant strategy incentive compatible. This means that if some mechanism can implement the social choice function, then a direct mechanism will work as well. This theorem tells us that we can safely constrain our search for mechanisms to the realm of direct mechanisms. So starting from the next lecture, we will be exclusively looking at direct mechanisms. The rest of this lecture, however, will be devoted to proving this version of the revelation principle. So proof of the revelation principle. Our premise is that there exists some mechanism that implements f and domain strategies. So let us start with that. Uh, let G be that mechanism. Let G implement f in dominant strategies. Which means that, thank you, which means that there exists a strategy profile, A star, and it is a domain strategy. So, there exists a strategy profile, A1 star to AN star, such that the outcome generated by these strategies a star n of theta n is exactly the same 
as the one desired by our social choice function given this type profile theta 1 to theta n. So this is just a retread of the definition of implementation domain strategies. This is what should have been here in these dots. So we know that this holds. And we know that this A star strategy profile is an equilibrium of domain strategies. Meaning that we know that this inequality holds ui of g i star ui of g of a i star theta i a minus i theta i is a little greater than ui of g of any other action I had, given a minus i, theta i. So this line verifies that our action profile ai star is indeed a domain strategy equilibrium profile. Right, so this inequality holds for all a minus i, all a hat, all theta i, and that's it. So this was a retread of the definitions because we did not have them available at hand. But what follows from this definition is that, in particular, this inequality on utilities holds if we only restrict other players' actions to what they would have played in this mechanism for some of their type uh, theta minus i. So it follows that this inequality holds ui of g of a i star theta i a minus i star theta minus i this to g theta i and this is greater than again the utility of a deviation for player i so some a hat a minus i of theta minus i theta i star and this holds for all theta i and theta minus i so a lot of symbols but what we did from this step from our initial premise that there exists a mechanism that implements g in domain strategies is this equation only restricts attention to those strategy profiles that other players, so players except for i, play in this domain strategy equilibrium. So the set of these inequalities is a subset of, of the set of these inequalities which we now hold. So those also hold. Okay. And then we can say that, oh, in particular, we can specify this even further. So instead of deviating to some arbitrary action a hat, we can say that player i deviates to just reporting other type theta i hat. So in addition to restricting the set of actions of all other players, a minus i, we are also restricting the set of deviations of player i. So in this set of inequalities, player i cannot deviate to any abstract action a hat. The only deviation that player i can do is to the equilibrium action of some other type of himself.
And you can see that this is already the pretty much this set of incentive compatibility constraints that we need for the direct revelation mechanism. So here, if we say that all players choose which type to report, so theta i, theta i hat, theta minus i, and then the player, the designer, chooses action a i star on their behalf directly, then what happens is it should be optimal for every player i to report their true type theta i, so the true type that affects their utility, it should be better for them to report their true type than to report any other type, given any possible report of everyone else. So this already gives us the, this set of incentive compatibility constraints is exactly the one that we will need for a direct revelation mechanism. We just need to change the notation, right? Because here it's, it's still that old mechanism with A and G, and we need to introduce another mechanism, the direct mechanism, with action sets given to the given by the type sets, and the outcome function G equal to F. So. Consider a direct revelation mechanism. I never have a notation for those, I think. Let us denote it gamma DRM. And it's given then by thetas, so these are action sets for every player, and f, the outcome function, is equal to our social choice function. Then, since g of a star theta equals f of theta, meaning that we implement the exact same outcome in the end in both of these cases. It's just in the former case, in the old mechanism, players made a report to the mechanism, and then we chose some, and then... Sorry, yeah, it's been three hours, my... I'm not able to speak coherently. In the old mechanism, the players chose some actions a star of theta, and then we chose the outcome g of a star of theta to be implemented. Now the players instead report their types theta, and we implement outcome f of theta. And these are the same outcomes. So nothing really changes except for the player's action sets. Just the labels of the actions they can choose, and maybe the number of the actions that they can choose uh, changes. But the outcome will still be the same. So if we plug this, into our incentive compatibility constraints here, we can rewrite them as ui of f of theta i, theta minus i, theta i, with the greater than ui of f theta i hat, theta minus i, uh, given the true type theta i. And again, these inequalities hold for all theta i, theta i hat, theta minus i. So the logic here. These inequalities are exactly, are exactly these inequalities. But these inequalities say that direct revelation mechanism is incentive compatible for the players. And so this then concludes the proof.